February 17th, 1974, this man by the name of Norio Suzuki sets out into the jungles of Lubang Island in the Philippines. And he's on a mission. Suzuki was this Japanese university student who had decided to drop out of school and travel the world. And so he did that for four years, traveling all over the world. And then he came back home to Japan, but he wasn't there long before he began to grow bored. He began to desire new challenges and was in search of new adventures. So he set this goal for himself that before he died, he wanted to discover three things. He wanted to go find three things. The first was he wanted to find a panda bear in the wild. The second is he wanted to travel to the Himalayas and find the Yeti, or the abominable snowman as he called it. And the third thing he wanted to find was a man by the name of Hiru Onada. And it was that third one that had him walking out into the jungles on this day. Onada was this uh, Japanese soldier who fought in the Philippines during World War II. But towards the end of the war, as the American forces began to take over those islands, almost every one of the Japanese soldiers was either captured or killed in combat. Except for this small handful of men, Onada and three others who managed to escape and fled up into the mountainous regions of the jungles where they hid out from the allied forces. And from there, they, they continued to try to take part in the war efforts. From time to time, they would travel down into some neighboring village and perform some kind of raid on it, uh, burning rice fields or, or killing cattle, sometimes even engaging in shootouts with the police. But then they would go back up into their mountain stronghold, hiding away in those jungles. And because they were hidden away so far back, cut off from civilization and cut off from the rest of the Japanese army, they had no idea when on August 15th, 1945, Japan announced that it would be surrendering to the Allied forces. They didn't know about it. So they continued living up there as though the war was going on. Now, the authorities knew that these men were up there. They just had no idea how to communicate with them, no idea how to get the news to them. And so they flew this airplane there over the jungles, and this airplane dropped all these leaflets down into the jungles, announcing to the men down there that the war is over. You can, you can come down now. It's, it's all done. And, and Onada and his men, they found these flyers, and they started reading them, and they looked at them and, and, and examined them, and, and they just... Well, they couldn't bring themselves to trust them. They were convinced that it was some kind of ploy by the Allied forces trying to trick them into coming down and giving themselves up. So they stayed. Sometime later, another plane flew over. This one actually dropped letters from the men's families and pictures of the men's families to prove that it was actually from them. But still, they weren't convinced. They couldn't bring themselves to believe it. This has to be some kind of a trick. And so they stayed. And the weeks turned into months, and the months turned into years. And over the course of time, one of the men actually slipped away from the group, went down and turned himself in. Another two, in, in different kind of occasions over the course of those years, two of them ended up dying in separate shootouts with the police. But Onada remained. Onada continued living up in those mountainous jungles for 29 years, fighting a war that no longer existed, living this life that did not match up with reality, this reality that the war was over. We see a similar picture taking place in John chapter 20, this group of people living these lives that don't line up with reality, these, these living this kind of behavior that doesn't match up with the truth. Those men were Peter and the rest of the disciples. It's early, Sunday morning, and those men are scattered around hiding in different parts of Jerusalem. And they are overcome with grief and sorrow. Because just a couple of days ago, on Friday, they had watched their rabbi, their Messiah, the one that they had left everything to follow, the one that they had pinned all of their hopes on, the one that they had had all their dreams up on this person. They had watched that man be crucified at the hands of the Roman and Jewish authorities. 
And in one day, all of their hopes and dreams, everything that they were hoping God was about to do in Israel and for Israel and in this world, everything, they saw it all just collapse down in front of their face. And so now they're hidden out in these rooms and they're afraid for their lives and they don't really even know if their lives are worth living. After all, everything that they had been living for just fell apart in front of them. See, the thing is, their lives didn't match up with reality. They didn't know this. But, but Jesus, no one was actually taking his life away from him on that Friday. In fact, he was laying it down voluntarily. And Jesus wasn't losing up there on that cross. He was actually winning the greatest battle ever fought, the battle against sin and death. And he was about to prove it to them. More than just prove it, he was about to deliver a death blow to sin and a death blow to all the world's powers and a death blow to even death itself. Now, earlier on that morning, like early, early, before the sun had even come up, it was dark, this group of women disciples, including one by the name of Mary Magdalene, had gone outside the city walls towards the tomb. They were going there to finish out preparation on the body because they hadn't got to finish all of that on Friday. So they made their way out there, and, and Peter and John know this, I'm sure, and they're hiding out in this room, aware that the women have gone, when all of a sudden, Mary Magdalene comes bursting through the doors of the house that they're sitting in, and she's out of breath, and there are tears streaming down her face, trying to catch her breath. All she can get out is, they've taken him. They've taken our Lord, and, and we don't know where they've put him. Now, we don't know exactly what she means when she says they. She might not even know. She, she might mean uh, Jewish leaders that, that as one final act of kind of disgrace towards Jesus, the Jewish leaders have come and stolen the body so that he cannot receive a proper burial, which would have been a really big, day, uh, big deal back in that culture. She might mean grave robbers who were not all that uncommon back then, people who would go through these graves and ransack them looking for valuables that they could sell off. We don't know, and, and Mary herself probably doesn't know. All she knows is that he's gone. And as soon as she gets these words out of her mouth, Peter and John take off out the door, headed outside the city and towards the tomb. Now John is younger. And so he's faster, and he gets to the tomb first. But when he gets there, he stops outside and kind of peeks in. Peter comes huffing and puffing behind John, but as soon as he gets there, he barrels John over and runs into the tomb. And when he gets into the tomb, he sees something kind of interesting. He, he looks around, and sure enough, the body is gone. But the grave clothes are still there, like wrapped up all nice and neat. Which doesn't make sense if the Jewish leaders had been the ones who came in and stole the body because they wouldn't have bothered to unwrap all of the, the wrappings, the grave clothes around it. They say that up to 75 pounds of spices and ointments could be on the body. That would have taken way too long. They would have just grabbed the body, grave clothes and all and taken it out. And it doesn't make sense if it was grave robbers because grave robbers would have just torn through everything and left it kind of ransacked all over the place. They wouldn't have bothered to clean up after themselves. But the body's gone, the, the clothes are still there, they're wrapped up nice and neat. It was, it was almost as if the body had just passed right through them. John walks in after Peter and he looks around and he tells us in his gospel that when he looked around, he believed. And, and we don't know if, if what he means by that when he says it, but it, it could just mean that he believed Mary. That he believed her, that the body is in fact gone. At any rate, Peter and John kind of walk away from the tomb, scratching their heads, talking through this. But Mary, Mary stays behind, right there at the tomb, and she is overwhelmed. She too had pinned all her hopes on this man. She too had left everything to follow the one who had rescued her. And the one that she hoped was going to rescue Israel. And this is where we pick up the story today. In John chapter 20, verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. 
Now, this is kind of an odd little dialogue here because usually when people in the Bible, when they see an angel, they freak out. But Mary doesn't do that. She just kind of carries on conversation with them. And we don't know if it's because maybe she's so overwhelmed in this moment that she's not really thinking clearly. Maybe she's crying so much she can't really see even what she's looking at when she's talking to them. But at any rate, she just kind of carries on this conversation with them. And then comes one of the coolest interactions ever. And I so wish I could have been there to see this. Verse 14, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Now, pause for just a minute there. Why does he ask her that question? Why does he ask her, why are you crying? He's Jesus. He knows why she was crying. He was there. He knows who she's looking for. So then why is he asking her that? You know what I think? I think that what Jesus is doing here is he's not actually asking her a question. He's not asking her anything. He's actually telling her something. Parents, we, we do this all the time, actually. We ask questions to our kids that are really statements. So I, I say things or my wife says something to, my, to our kids like, why did you jump into the bathtub with all of your clothes on? Right? Or why were you trying to cut the cat's tail off with a pair of scissors? <laughs> or, or why did you eat a french fry that you found on the ground in the corner of the garage? All things that have happened at my house, by the way. But, but see, listen, when my wife and I, when we ask those questions, we're not actually asking our kids anything. We're telling them something. We're telling them, you don't jump into the bathtub with all your clothes on. We're telling them, never try to cut the cat's tail off. We're telling them, son, you can't eat food that you find on the ground in the garage. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here when he asks Mary this question. He's telling her something. He's telling her, Mary, you have no idea. I know you don't know this yet. But you have no idea how out of place those tears are here. See, crying is what you do at funerals. Crying is what you do when you've lost a loved one. Crying is what you do when death has won. But none of that is taking place right here. The story continues. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And now she recognizes that voice. Mary, and she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So when Mary realizes that it's Jesus, she cannot believe her eyes, she can't believe her ears, and she's so excited. She latches on to him, she grabs a hold of him, so happy to have him back. And Mary says, wait, or J Jesus says, wait, wait, I, I, I know you're excited, Mary, but we got work to do. I need you to run and tell my disciples the news. I need you to tell them what you've seen and what you've heard and tell them to meet me before I ascend to my father. And so Mary turns around and goes sprinting back into Jerusalem with the greatest news in the history of the world. Let's take a brief intermission with me for a minute and walk back to those jungles in the Philippines. When Suzuki goes walking out into the jungles on February 17th, there are a lot of people who think he's never going to find Onada. There are a lot of people who think Onada's not even alive anymore. I mean, it, how can a man exist and survive up in the jungles by himself for three decades? It's not possible. You're never going to find him up there. But Suzuki sets out anyway. He walks out, and it takes him just four days to find him. As a matter of fact, he took a picture of him to prove it to everyone. Suzuki is the young man there smiling and kind of turning away from the camera. Onada is the man in the very worn out military uniform. And, and Suzuki finds him. That, that, that was the easy part actually. It didn't take very long at all. The hard part was getting Onada to trust him, was getting Onada to believe him when he tried to tell him, Lieutenant Onada, the war is over. You can come home. 
In fact, Onada wouldn't believe him. Liked him, but he wouldn't believe him. And so Suzuki had to actually go back to Japan and he brought this picture with him to, to prove to the Japanese government that Onada exists. And, and he showed it to him and Japan had to actually find Onada's ex-commander, like his commanding officer from World War II. This guy was now 80-something years old and he was this book salesman in Japan. And, and they get this 80-year-old book salesman and they fly him over to the Philippines and he goes out in the jungle and he has to meet up with Onada. And he meets him and he tells him, son... The war is over. You can go home now. You don't have to live like this anymore. And Onada finally believes. And on that day, he walked out of the jungle and into a brand new life. Back to Jerusalem. Mary goes running back into town with this news. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So Mary runs in, she finds the disciples where they are. She tells them Jesus is alive and the news she gives them is amazing and it's incredible and it seems too good to be true. And they can't bring themselves to believe it. And so like Onada, they continue hiding away in fear. Then, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, so we're still on Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So there the disciples are hiding out, scared, afraid, sad, and all of a sudden Jesus appears in the room to them and he says to them, peace. It's a common Jewish greeting even today, shalom. But it has never held more significance than in these moments. Because Jesus shows up, says peace, and he shows his hands inside to them to prove that it's actually him. And in that moment, the nightmare that they've been living for the last three days just fades away. And John says the disciples are overjoyed to get to see Jesus again. And it's about to get even better. He continues, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't know if they're actually receiving the Spirit in this moment. What, what's happening? Whether he's giving them the Holy Spirit right here or whether this is like a promise of the Holy Spirit. And they'll receive him later, like 50 days later at Pentecost. We do know this, though, that the reason that they're able to receive the Holy Spirit is because Jesus has resurrected from the grave. John tells us earlier in John chapter 7 that the Holy Spirit had not yet come because Jesus had not yet been glorified. That he had not died and risen again. But now he has. And now everything changes. Now the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them. Now they have this brand new ability to know Jesus and to love him and to obey him. Now they have the very power that raised Jesus from the grave residing inside of them. And all because of the resurrection. See, if you ask most people, what does the resurrection mean? I think most people would tell you the resurrection means that Jesus is alive, which is true and wonderful news. But the resurrection means so much more than that. The resurrection means that you and I, when we place our faith in Jesus, now the third member of the Trinity, God himself, comes to dwell inside of us, giving a brand new ability to us to love and obey him, giving us a new power for serving him, which we'll talk about tomorrow. The resurrection means that death has been fully defeated, not just for Jesus, but for us. So now we know it's not the end for us anymore, and we don't have to live in fear of it anymore. The resurrection means that Jesus is now the reigning king of all things, which means those of you who've come forward this week and dropped a rock, a rock in the bucket, it means that when you did that, you were not just declaring, Jesus, I want you to forgive me of my sins. Yes, you were doing that, but you were also declaring, and I hope you know this, I hope somebody told you this, you were also declaring, Jesus, all of my loyalty, all of my allegiance, all of my life belongs to you, my new king. 
The resurrection means, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, which means your past sins, whether the ones you committed or the ones that were committed against you, do not define you anymore, and you don't have to live in them anymore. But the thing is, there seem to be a lot of Christians who, who don't know that. Or maybe they just don't understand that. Or, or maybe they cannot bring themselves to trust it. And so a lot of them end up living these lives that don't line up with the reality of the resurrection. And when they do that, actually I should probably pause there and say, when we do that. Because I can be just as guilty of this. When we do that, we look like... We look like Lieutenant Onada, hiding away in a jungle, fighting a war that doesn't exist. We look like Mary, crying outside the tomb of a living Savior. We look like Peter, hidden away in fear after his Lord had just won the greatest battle of all time. And I wonder if in those moments, if Jesus doesn't come to us through his Holy Spirit and ask us the same kind of questions that he asked Mary... You know, those questions that are really statements. Questions like, why are you still living as though sin is your master, as though it has all the control over your life? I have given you my Holy Spirit, which has been and will always be stronger than any sin or temptation you will ever face. Why are you living this fear-filled and often prideful life as though you're the one who sits on the throne and everything depends on you keeping your crap together in order for life to work out the right way? No, I sit on the throne. I'm the king. I'm the one who is in control of all these things. Why are you so consumed with what people think of you as though you need them to like you or think highly of you in order for you to have any kind of identity? No, I have given you a new identity in me. Brothers and sisters, the war is over. Jesus has risen from the grave. We don't have to live like that anymore. And I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that it's all going to be easy. I'm not trying to tell you that we're never going to struggle. We're never going to have any problems. No, we'll still wrestle with our sins sometimes. Life will still be hard. Jesus told us that much, that in this world we will have troubles because we live in a sinful and broken world that does not know the truth. But we do. We know who sits on the throne. We know that death is not the end for us. We know that sin is no longer our master. We know that Jesus is with us at all times. And we know that he is at work in this world to make all things new. And one day he will restore it all. But he has already begun that process in us, his church. Brothers and sisters, we live in a new kingdom, in a new reality. Believe that. Trust that. Live in light of that truth.